Hello, and uh, thank you all for coming uh, to this presentation um, here at the Southboro uh, Senior Center. My name is Arthur Bergeron. For those of you who don't know me, I work at a firm called Myrick O'Connell. There are 60 of us there. Uh, I do nothing but elder law. If you had a different kind of question, there's somebody there who could figure it out, but not me. So um, I've been doing these presentations here in Southboro now for a number of years, and some topics are very, very general in nature and some are much more specific. And I'm always hesitant when I do real specific ones because there are less people who come because I'm talking about something very specific. But at the same time, there are some kind of specific pieces of information that you need to know. And this is one of them. Um, what to do, making the best of a bad situation. So this is really for folks uh, who have not planned ahead, uh, who may have been worried about the possibility that somebody might get Alzheimer's and ha have dementia and need care but just to, the many clients who've told me, it'll never happen to me, I'm gonna shoot myself. I've been doing this for 40 years, no one has yet shot themselves, right? But they keep threatening, they're gonna, but they don't. Typically because they can't find the gun at that point, that's always kind of, I assume. So anyway, this is about what happens in that situation. So you know my friends, Frank and Mary, and their children, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr. Um, you know that their goal has been and continues to be to live in their house until they die and be buried in the backyard and they're gonna leave all of their assets to their kids. Um, and one of the things that you may remember, and here are their assets, they, they're eight, both 80 years old, they own a home, it's a small home with no mortgage, $300,000. They have a IRA worth about, he has an IRA worth 150. Uh, they have an annuity worth 100 and they have bank accounts worth 75. So they've got $625,000 in assets. Uh, he has an income of fifteen or of two thousand uh, dollars a month, um, and that's coming from all from Social Security. Uh, Mary has income of half of his, or one thousand dollars a month. So their income is three thousand dollars a month. They've been living at their home. They've been doing okay. They didn't have a major medical emergency. Um, and the first and and what I have explained to, to I, there are several people here whom I've seen before. What I've explained to you in the past is that in that situation. If, if Mary needs nursing home care and therefore needs to qualify for Mass Health, they're, they're still okay. They're still okay. They don't have to have done any advanced planning, uh, even if she's stuck in the nursing home, because, because for her to qualify for Mass Health, while she has to show that she has less than $2,000 in countable assets, he, as the spouse at home, can own the home itself, as long as it has assets of less than eight, as long as it has an equity of less than eight hundred twenty-eight thousand dollars, he can have cash or cash equivalent assets of up to one hundred nineteen thousand two hundred twenty dollars, and most importantly, he can have unlimited income. Unlimited income. So if she goes to the nursing home, then the strategy is very simple: you shift everything to him, and then to the extent that his assets, not counting the house, are are, are more than one hundred nineteen thousand two hundred twenty dollars. You, he, he goes and buys an annuity. As long as an annuity, what is that? It is a contract between an individual and an insurance company. Uh, you pay money to the insurance company and in return they, they agree to pay you back some money. They're gonna pay you uh, monthly payments. As long as the annuity that Frank buys calls for monthly payments over a term that is shorter than his actuarial life expectancy, then the purchase of that annuity in any amount is a legitimate, conversion from a countable asset to a non-countable income stream. So the day after Frank buys the annuity, thereby converting his assets or getting his assets below that $119,220, Mary's eligible for mass health. Mary is eligible for mass health. By the way, earlier this morning, this case came in the door. This, these cases came in, but to just give you the example, these folks have $2 million dollars. Uh, the wife is in the nursing home and has been there for a while because the husband was told that he couldn't pos she couldn't possibly qualify for mass health. Said that is incorrect. They have a fairly large house um, worth about six hundred thousand dollars, and they have a million four in other assets. So we're just going to shift the house and all the million four in other assets to the husband. The husband's going to turn around and buy a, a an annuity for about a million uh, three, leaving him with a hundred thousand dollars in assets. And the day after he buys that annuity she will be on mass health. Um, now there, will be, there may be reasons why they don't want to do that, and we're going to talk about that a little bit later in terms of, 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 of another situation, but the point is he can always qualify. She can always qualify for mass health. And the question, the, the problem though, typically occurs not here, 
And I know I've done this presentation before and people always come up to me and say, yeah, but my husband's dead, right? Now what do I do? And, and, that's, and, that's, and by the way, once again, if, if, if you were Frank and Mary and you had shifted everything to Frank, the only other thing that Frank would want to do um, is change his will to say that upon his death, all of his assets were going to, that were otherwise going to go to Mary, because remember that was their plan, that we're going to leave things to each other and then to the kids, that the assets that were going to go to Mary will instead go and trust for Mary's benefit. And he can name one of the kids as the trustees, he can name anybody he wants as the trustee. The point is that as long as things are structured that way and Frank dies, those assets are then still going to be safe because they're going to be in trust for Mary and none of those, that money has to, will get tapped into. But so the question then is though, what happens if Frank has died and they haven't done any of that, right? And what happens if they haven't done any advance planning? And so now this is the situation. Mary's 80 years old. She owns all of those assets. She has income of now $2,000 a month because she's now getting Frank's check, right? Uh, and now she goes to the nursing home. Now, does all of this money have to get spent down? In, if, if in the absence of any other planning, what will happen here is all the cash or cash equivalents will get spent down to $2,000. That will take about two years. So the typical nursing home um, costs you about $150,000 a year all, or about um, $400 a day. Although I have to say, I was speaking to this once again, this guy this morning, and he was saying that actually his wife's nursing home is costing him $15,000 a month. It's $15,000 a month. So times 12, that's almost, that's about $180,000 a year, right? So it's big money. So the money would evaporate after two years and then Mary would, would qualify for Mass Health because this house is not a countable asset as long as she says on her Mass Health application that she intends to return home, even if she has no chance of ever returning home. But following her death, Mass Health will have a lien on that house. They'll put a lien on as soon as they qualify her and they'll, get to, they'll, they'll have a lien on the house to get their money back for what they paid on her behalf. And, and if you go to a nursing home today, I'm not saying all nursing homes, but many, if you go to a nursing home today in this situation, they're going to, or you're one of the kids, you're Peter, Paul, or Mary Jr., they're going to tell you, well, you need to go talk to somebody about this. We can even suggest some people for you to talk to to help you do your mass health application. And those people that they've sent you to talk to will say, oh, Mary's not eligible. She's got too much in assets. Um, and therefore, you need to spend down your money. They won't tell you that there's anything else that you can do to make her eligible. And that's what we're going to talk about a little bit today. So, um, before, so, so th this is the question for Mary now. Now what? She's in the nursing home. She has all of those other assets. So, um, to understand what we're going to talk about, you need to understand something very fundamental to the mass health system, but that most people don't know. And that is that that nursing home, we're assuming that Mary is right now in a nursing home in a bed, in a double, have to be in a double uh, if you're qualifying for Mass Health, that is costing her $12,000 a month. Um, that exact same room in that same nursing home, once she is on Mass Health, she, all of her income will have to go to the nursing home. Remember that $2,000 a month that, that she earns will have to go to the nursing home minus a very small adjustment, $72 that she gets to keep to do her nails and her hair, and, right? Not very much, $72 a month. But MassHealth will then pay the rest of the nursing home bill. But the rest is not all the way up to $12,000. It's up to the MassHealth rate for that bed. And MassHealth negotiates individual contracts with all of the nursing homes around the state. And each nursing home, the contract calls for payments according to a chart that goes from 1 to 10, level numbers 1 to 10. And the levels go up depending on how, the estimated number of nurse minutes per day. Isn't that a great bureaucratic type term? That, that Mary is going to need every day in the nursing home. Uh, and the more care she needs, the more MassHealth pays. But the key thing to remember is that probably the highest rate at this nursing home, which char is charging privately $12,000 a month, is probably no higher than about $7,000 a month, right? Typically. And so we're going to use those assumptions when we go through this analysis today, that the private pay is $12,000 a month and that the nursing home rate is $7,000 a month. And that, so that the difference the difference that Mary derives and her family derives 
from having Mary in that same bed on Mass Health versus on private pay is a savings of $5,000 a month or $60,000 a year. So the strategies we're going to talk about uh, involve qualifying for Mary, Mary for Mass Health, even though in the long run Mary or her children are going to have to pay Mass Health what Mass Health paid, because they still benefit because they're paying Mass Health at such a lower rate. So that if, for example, Mary goes into a nursing home for a year on private pay, as we just mentioned, she would have eaten up all of her money at twelve thousand uh, dollars uh, a month or $150,000 a year, she would have eaten up $300,000 over, over two years. During those same two years, if she had been on Mass Health, um, she would have been eating up about uh, um, $7,000 a month. So it, it's, it's the difference is $5,000 a month, right? So she would be paying substantially less. In terms of what that is doing to her savings, right, the money that she has, Remember, her income is $2,000 a month, so that when she's in the nursing home paying $12,000 a month, the burn rate on her savings is really only $10,000 a month, because every month that she's there, she's paying, out of, she's paying her Social Security check. The only amount that she has to pull out of her savings, the so-called burn rate, the, way, the rate at which the money burns away, is only $10,000 a month. Right? When she's on mass health, if she could be on Mass Health, Mass Health paying the bill, her Social Security is continuing to go to Mass Health for $2,000 a month. Mass Health is paying the, the difference, or $5,000 a month, to Mass Health, right? And $5,000 a month is all that would ever have to get reimbursed to Mass Health after Mary dies. So it's important to understand this differential. There's basically a, a $5,000 difference for Mary at this nursing home between being on private pay and being on Mass Health. So she derives this benefit from qualifying for Mass Health. So on private pay, her burn rate, um, that is the, the, the amount of savings that she has to spend per month, is $12,000 minus the $2,000 or $10,000 a month. Um, at that rate, with $325,000 in assets, and remember that's what she, we said she had. She had a house worth three hundred, dollars and then she had other assets worth three twenty-five. dollars dollars At that rate, all of her assets would be exhausted in 32.5 months, right? Or if she sold her house, thereby converting the house into cash and stayed on, on, at, on, on private pay, at that rate, all of her savings would be exhausted in 62.5 months, or about five years. All of her cash, $10,000 a month, for 62.5 months is $625,000. So, to qualify for Mass Health, remember the house is not countable. Other assets, $2,000, she can't have more than $2,000. Um, as I had mentioned to you, once she's qualified, Mass Health will let her keep $72.80. They've gone up, actually, it was 72, like 40. They just went up. Um, and, and Mass Health is going to pay the nursing home the difference. And then they're going to want recovery for that after Mary dies. That's how the system works. So, Mary has three options in order to qualify for Mass Health with the assets that she has. She can either go buy an annuity herself, uh, or she can uh, lend her children all of the money, uh, or anybody else she wants to, but typically it's the children, and have them give her back a promissory note for that money. Uh, or she can put money in a D4C pooled trust. What in the world is that? Right? Well, we're going to talk about those three things as we go through and talk about how, the, how Mary in this situation might want to use those tools. As I said to somebody at the beginning of this presentation, sorry about that, this is the complicated one. Right? I do a lot of presentations here, this is the most complicated. And it, it does involve kind of following the math. Right? But I'm going to keep on emphasizing, I'm, I'm going to do the math for you so you see conceptually how it works. Right? These, the numbers are going to vary depending on your situation, but the, the takeaway is you have to do the math. So, what is an annuity? Once again, the, there are many kinds of annuities. The guy that's trying to sell you an annuity when he's going to your house is probably not trying to sell you this one. He's trying to sell you an, what he's calling an annuity, but it's really just kind of an investment fund. He's saying, give me all your money and I'll go invest it for you, and you can pull out whatever you want, except you may have to pay a penalty uh, if you pull it out early. But I'm going to get you this great rate. That's what an annuity salesman is going to try to sell you. This is 
a different kind of annuity. These are, these are what annuities traditionally were. An annuity, okay, it was an old, from an old Latin term, it was, it was a promise to pay you annually an amount of money. Oftentimes it would show up in wills that people would say, for my children, I want you to, you know, them to get a check of X number of dollars for all of their lives once a year, hence the name annuity, right? So um, the type of annuity that Mary would need to buy in order to cause um, this, the purchase of the annuity to not be considered a gift or an invalid transfer is an annuity that calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is not longer than her actuarial life expectancy. At Mary's uh, age, her life expectancy is still quite a few years. I think it's about seven years at, at age 80. Um, no, actually it's even longer than that. So, her, but it can't be longer than her actuarial life expectancy. Uh, and then when she dies, if there are still payments left to be paid to Mary, they can go to her kids except Mass Health has a lien on those payments to get repaid first, right? So that if Mass Health has qualified her for, for Mass Health because she qualified, and then um, paid her on her behalf that five thousand dollars per year for two two years, then at the end of those two years, Mass Health would be owed sixty thousand dollars, and they'd get those that out of these monthly payments. They wouldn't be able to get them all of a sudden because the the, the annuity has to be paying monthly. It doesn't has no lump sum payments. So. That's one of the things that she could do. Um, now, if she did that, and remember, those are her assets, right? So she has the house worth 300 and everything else put together is worth 325. So if she were to buy that annuity, right? Um, it, it, as a matter of fact, I knew I had a slide that did this. Her actuarial life expectancy is actually nine years. How do I know this? Because MassHealth has a chart, right? Because the question isn't what your real life expectancy is. You can be buying this annuity even if you're really sick. Makes no difference, right? The question is, what does it say on the chart? And the chart, their chart says that if you're 80 years old and a woman, your actuarial life expectancy is nine years. It's a little shorter if you're a man. So um, if she bought, took her $325,000 and bought an annuity um, that lasted nine years, that would pay uh, 108 payments. There are 108 months in nine years, right? If she did that, and if we assume that the annuity was paying a terrible interest rate on the money, because that's you do the annuity, you give the insurance company the money. They don't just give it back to you. They're paying you interest on that money. But the interest, like all interest right now, is crummy, right? So I'm assuming that there's no interest, right? So this is the worst case. If you assume that, that she bought this annuity for 108 payments, and divide that into 325,000, rounded, that means she's getting back about $3,000 per month on her annuity, 3,000 a month. Now, um, remember, the, once she's on Mass Health, the rate, the Mass Health rate is seven is um, seven thousand um, dollars. She has regular income that she's continuing to get that is now being paid to Mass Health of two thousand dollars a month, uh, and now she's also getting those those three thousand dollar per month payments from the annuity. So her income has now gone from two thousand a month to five thousand a month, and that's all going to the nursing home. Right? That's all going to the nursing home, right? And then MassHealth is paying the difference, the extra $2,000, the difference between $5,000 and the, and the $7,000. But as a practical, so, so she's paying the nursing home some money, and then when, when she dies, MassHealth is going to be owed some money for the, for the little gap that they paid, right? But as a result of doing this, right, her money, the, the, the $325,000 that she, that she had, um, ends up getting exhausted in, um, in, um, 65, in um, 65 months or 10.5 years, right? So what she did was she really, she really stretched her money, right? Um, in order to, to and, and as a result, um, if she died during that period, the likelihood is much higher that her children are going to be able to get some of this money back. Right? Because that's kind of the goal of this exercise as far as the annuity is concerned. Is you're saying to yourself, if you're Mary, you're in the nursing home, in a bed, right? And your life isn't going to change whether you're on private pay or on mass health. By the way, there is this kind of myth that I often hear that people who are on private pay get much better care than people who are on mass health. Actually, not true. 
In, and in many cases, the opposite is true. The people who get the best care at the nursing home are the people whose relatives show up the most. Because they, they're there, they're doing all this stuff for you, the relatives. They're not doing it for the person in the nursing home. Right? I, that sounds very cynical of me, but that, that's been, I've found to be the case, that people, are, are, people get great care if their relatives are always there visiting, especially at different hours. Right? <clears throat> but, and if they're not visiting, people get really not so great care unless they're on mass health because these folks all know the nursing homes all know that mass health sends in investigators all the time a lot of times undercover pretending to be relatives right to see what kind of care you're getting because mass health wants to know mass health is funding 70 percent of all the beds in all the nursing homes they really want to know and they are the biggest payer to the nursing home so the nursing home wants the mass health people to be getting good care because they want mass health to be happy okay so, um, so you can buy that annuity and as a result substantially save a lot of money. Now a second alternative um, is to take that same amount of money, whatever amount of money you had, and go, buy, and go lend it to your kids, have them give, pay you back together with interest, right? Uh, and sign a promissory note for that as long as that promissory note has certain characteristics, just like the annuity, as long as it calls for equal monthly payments over a term that is not longer than your actuarial life expectancy, then, and as long as it can't be canceled or transferred or anything else, then the annuity actually, the, the promissory note actually works also. I have typically not recommended that clients use promissory notes unless the annuity option isn't available because in other states these have been challenged. Uh, and I think that in the long run, as MassHealth tightens up, they're not going to be allowing these. Um, but I am just telling you that as of right now, that option is available, okay? So that's the annuity option. You buy the annuity, you get these kind of long payments, right? Uh, and then you qualify. And, and, and in, in Mary's case, once again, she doesn't need to sell, wouldn't need to sell her house, get all of that turned into cash, and then buy an annuity, right? All she'd need to do is simply buy an annuity with her cash, because remember, Mary can own her house and still qualify for mass health. There'll be a lien on it, so that after she dies, mass health is gonna to have to get repaid, but that's okay. The point of buying the annuity and then leaving the house where it is, is that in the long run, mass health is getting paid back, but what, ends up, what ended up getting paid to the nursing home was $5,000 less a month than what she would have been paying on mass health, right? But then what she would have been paying if she were on private pay. So that's the goal of the exercise. So, so why would you not want to just do this automatically and always buy an annuity. Well, one reason may be that it may be that what you want while Mary is in the nursing home, if you're one of the kids, Peter, Paul, and Mary Jr., is that you want to make sure that you've got some funds to, to keep Mary's quality of life better. Because remember, once Mary is on mass health, she's poor, right? She's got, no, she's got assets of less than $2,000. All of her income has to be paid to the nursing home except for $72. So if she loses some clothes, needs an extra pair of glasses, any number of things happen in the nursing home, um, um, there's no money to pay it. And typically the kids are paying for all of that, right? And if she wants to improve some of the, the stuff that she uses at the nursing home, there's no money to pay for that. The example that I, that I there are two examples that I always give. Um, one, when you go to a nursing home, anybody here been to a nursing home? Ah, yes, okay, so you know. The worst part, there are two, nursing homes aren't so great. I'm hoping that that's going to change over time as part of another initiative that's happening in this area to have communities become dementia-friendly communities, but that's a different topic. The, the, the nursing home, there are two things about them that I find are really hard. One, you know, you go to the nursing home and you look down the corridor and you're seeing that little lady, typically it's a lady, or a man in a, in a wheelchair and they're hunched over like this right? And they're trying to sleep. Now why is that? That is because that person is sitting in the wrong wheelchair. That person sitting in a wheelchair, it's got a cloth back, it's got aluminum arms, and it was designed not for sleeping but for getting her from one room to another, right? That's what the nursing home has for wheelchairs, right? And, and that's what their people are sleeping in. Now that wheelchair cost the nursing home less than $1,000. Now for $10,000, 
You can buy a wheelchair, it reclines, it's well padded, you can have a little TV set, you can have headphones, you can have them actually powered, you know, you can power your own, so that if you have a person who's just got physical problems, but had, still has a lot of cognitive ability, they can get around in their wheelchair. And, and the wheelchair is a big deal, right? Because for the typical person in a nursing home, they're either in bed or they're in that wheelchair. So you can really improve that person's life, but somebody's got to find $10,000. Um, second thing about being in a double, right? And there are very few singles in nursing homes, like in many, none, but in some, maybe there are few rooms, is the trouble with the double is your other roommate, right? I mean, I was just in one of these last week, and so there's the other, there's the other roommate who is sitting up and watching TV, very loud, in Spanish, right? Th this makes it very stressful <laughs> for the person who was there, who was my client. Now, but, you, but that's a problem you can remedy, right? You can remedy it with a flat screen TV, so you can watch your own TV, and headphones, or earbuds, or a CD player. Maybe you don't, don't like watching TV, or maybe your eyes aren't good, so you really can't see it, but the music might be really good, right? And in any event, something to keep the noise away so that you can just be in your own space in a much better way, even though you're in a double, right? All of these things can be paid for by the D4C. So what is the D4C? The, uh, D4C if you want to learn more about D4Cs, Google pooled trusts, P-O-O-L-E-D, pooled trusts. The term D4C is simply the last three initials of the federal statute, it's part of the Medicaid statute that allows this, that allows people to transfer funds to a, D4, a, a, a trust authorized under technically a statute called 42 U.S.C. 1396P, I think 1A D4C. So the last three letters things are D4C. So a pool trust, um, these, in order to be in, a legitimate, they have to be nonprofits that are operated for the benefit of elderly or disabled people. Um, you have to sign a contract with them whereby you agree that you will be transferring them your funds and then they will be pooling those funds, hence the name pooled trust, with the other funds that they have. They invest and reinvest that money, they make money on it. They'll charge you an application fee, typically less than $1,000. They'll charge you a, a, an annual fee for kind of maintaining the funds, typically one point or one percent, right? but they typically earn be much better than that because they're pooled, they've got a lot of money pooled. I know we use, we've used, I guess, all of the pool trusts in Massachusetts, but we use one a lot. They're probably holding six or seven million dollars of my client's money. And the, but they've got total about 40 million dollars, you know? So, so they're, they're, uh, they're investing a lot of money, so they make money on their money. Now, that contract that you sign with them will also say that, that um, after the person who transferred the money dies, right, the pooled trust gets to keep a percentage of what's left, and we're going to talk about that in a few minutes, right? And then after that, um, MassHealth has a lien on what's left to get repaid for any month, money that they had paid while that person was on MassHealth. So in terms of the amount that gets paid to MassHealth, it's exactly the same whether the money goes into the D4C pool trust or whether you put it into the annuity, right? So you're not, you're not escaping mass health. There is no way to escape having to pay back mass health at the mass health rate. Once again, though, this is a, a, a tool to allow Mary to be on mass health and therefore burning away her money at a lower rate. So a little bit more about those pool trusts. So you have in your fol folder, um, all the names of the five pool trusts that are now in Massachusetts, so you can actually Google any of them also if you want more information, or if you want to compare um, pricing, right? Because some of them will charge you more and some less, especially in terms of that so-called commission that they charge at the end. By the way, what do they do with that money that they keep at the end? They don't just go out for a party. They, they are all uh, nonprofits that are doing work for the, for the poor and disabled, so they use the money to advance their mission of helping the poor or disabled. So I was just talking to you about some of the things that the pool trust money could be used to buy. Um, in addition to the flat screen TV, just better furniture uh, in the room, right? Just a better chair, not an institutional chair. Maybe you're really comfortable sitting chair for Mary to sit in 
or a better bed. You don't have to be using their bed, right? You can get a much better one. Better food, you can order out. You can get meals catered. If Mary's capable of doing it, you can go out with Mary. You can actually go with Mary on a trip. You can go to Florida with Mary. As a matter of fact, the D4C will pay you to go to Florida with Mary because she obviously can't go by herself. She needs a companion, right? So all, anything that is going to improve Mary's quality of life, right, can be done. Home maintenance. Remember we, we said in this case, you know, what if Mary used all of the cash and put it into the D4C but kept her house? Well, you know, if she keeps her house, her problem is how is she going to pay the bills on that house, right? Because remember now, all of her income has to go to the nursing home. So how is she paying her taxes or her insurance or the heating bill or any of those bills? Well, if she moved the money to the D4C, the D4C could do all of that. So the D4C could maintain the house, um, which is, which, once again, not a countable asset while she is in the nursing home. So the D4C can be used. And the reason why I've got the lobster, so one of my favorite stories. And once I was doing one of these presentations, and like the people here, no one in the whole audience had any clue what a D4C was. So one lady came up to me afterwards, and she said, oh, Mr. Bergeron, um, so my mother's been in the nursing home for two or three years, and so she started with a quarter of a million dollars, and now she only has $60,000 left. So it really wouldn't be worth doing one of these D4Cs for her, would it? And I said, wait, I said, in nursing home land, $60,000 is not a lot of money. Right? That's only a few months in the nursing home. But in the real world, that's a lot of money. I said, so if you put that money into the D4C, you could use it to, to pay for things that your mother might want. I said, and, and so, so she ended up, she decided to do it. So she'll, we put the money in the D4C. And then one of the things that the folks in the D4C do is they'll send a, a social worker out to talk to you and say, and say so what, what does your mother want? So we met with the social worker, I was there. Um, and the social worker said, so, you know, does your mother watch, watch a lot of movies? You know, we could buy our old movies, we could do a flat screen TV. This was before Netflix, you know, so you actually had to have movies. She said, well, actually, no, my mother, she was, mother was 92 or 93. She's pretty, pretty blind, right? She said, well, how about music? You know, does she like, is there any old songs that she likes, or new songs? You know, we could buy her any number of CDs. We can get her headphones, a CD player. Well, no, she's pretty deaf too, said the, <laughs> the daughter. So finally the woman said, well, does she have any favorite foods, right? And the, and the, and the woman said, so this woman was like 65, right? So she said, the mother's 92. And she said, you know, we grew up poor, you know, but a couple times a year as a treat, my dad would take us out and we'd all have lobster, right? We'd go to the show, we'd have lobster. My mother loved lobster. And the, woman, the social worker was great. She said, your mother can have lobster every day if she wants. Um, she, this lady died about three years later, and I talked to the daughter. She said, yeah, the mother had like lobster once a week, you know, for the last three years. Of, and what's wrong with that, right? You know, it's like it was her money. There's a, there's a classic saved, you know, scrimped all her life and spent to, had a quarter of a million dollars, most of which went to the nursing home, but at least she got to have lobster. So, the money can be spent in a number of ways. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more as we go along. Um, but, the, but, but, as I had mentioned, when Mary dies, the D4C is going to want a percentage of what the money uh, is that is left to go to them. So as opposed to buying an annuity where you know that after the older person dies, once the mass health lien has been paid, everything else is coming back to the kids. In this case, there were two bills to be paid. First, the D4C, uh, and the D4C, um, some will charge as high as 20%. It's typically between, if, it, if you die within the first year or two, the percentage tends to be lower, like 5 to 10%. But if you live a prolonged period, the percentage tends to be 15 to 20%. Um, so you have to take off that percent, and then from the remainder, MassHealth has to get repaid. So, uh, as an example, uh, so once again, assume that the mass health rate is $7,000 per month, right? The burn rate um, as a result is um, $5,000 a month. That's what's going to have to get repaid to um, mass health after Mary dies. So if you, if you took all of her money, the $325,000, and you put it into an annuity, remember that money lasted for 
quite a while, right? If instead you put all of the money into the D4C, right, and pretend that you hadn't spent a dime on Mary for the whole time, so that all of that money were still in the account at the time that she died, then the D4C would be entitled in the, in, on the highest case to 20% of that money. So what would be left uh, is 80% of that $325,000 or only $260,000 and then MassHealth would have a lien on that money, right? Now if you applied that formula, right, and figuring out how much MassHealth is owed every month, it turns out that using that formula all of the money would be exhausted at the end of 4.3 years. So if Mary had lived more than 4.3 years, um, 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 there wouldn't be anything left of that cash for the kids, right? By the way, though, in this situation, there'd still be the house. The house would still be left, right? But there wouldn't be any cash left. Um, so there's the annuity, and then there's the D4C. Each of them has a different kind of purpose, right? Each has pluses and minuses. The most common plan that ends up getting executed by people that I deal with is, a, is some kind of blended plan, a blended plan, where they'll, what they'll say is they'll say, okay, so we're gonna, we're gonna figure out, in the ideal case, the annuity payment that would go to Mary that will cause her, the amount of money that she has every month, to be almost exactly equal to whatever the, the mass health nursing home bill was gonna be. And remember that bill was $7,000 a month, right? So we'll try to figure out, we'll buy an annuity that's going to cause that payment to occur. And then what we've got left, we'll put into the D4C. If we assume that the amount of money uh, that Mary is going to need to spend every year, or every month, excuse me, to take care of the mass health payment is $5,000 per month, right? And if you assume that Mary has, and, and and if, you, and if you were buying an annuity, paying $5,000 a month to run for four years, because you were taking a guess, you were saying, we're gonna guess that Mary is gonna live no more than four years. So that's the length of the time that we're gonna do for the annuity. That would cost you $240,000. Mary would then have $85,000 left, right? Or the difference between the 325 and the 240 to put into the D4C. Chances are $85,000 is gonna be plenty of money to take care of all of Mary's supplemental needs during that four year period, to buy the great wheelchair, to buy the furniture, buy a lot of lobster, take her on some trips, do whatever, right? At the end then, um, after her death, uh, the, 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 the so-called, the, the commission that the D4C would be charging, even if they hadn't spent any money during that period, so that all of the, of the 85,000 were still in the D4C, would be only 20% of 85,000, which means there'd still be, um, that other amount right there, that 17,000 would be the commission and there'd be the rest of the money left over. So you can blend the rate. Now, how do you decide if you, if, what you're gonna do? If you're Mary, or more typically if you're Mary's kids, how do you figure out how you're gonna do this? Well, um, there were two kind of really important possible issues. One is, what is Mary's estimated life expectancy? Take a guess, right? Is Mary really sick, right? Or does Mary have early stage dementia and she's just gonna, she could live in a, but she's healthy as a horse, she could live five or 10 more years. What's going on there? And what are her estimated D4C needs, right? Is she physically um, disabled but mentally fine? Can she still travel, right? Would she benefit from the things that we were talking about here, right? And the big one really is gonna be the trips. You know, if she still has the ability to get out and the D4C can pay for it, then you may wanna put a lot of money in the D4C. But I'm gonna give you a couple of more examples. Suppose that were Mary's situation. Suppose she had a house worth 300,000, but she only had 75,000 in cash, right? In that situation, um, remember the D4C can pay for any of that stuff, and $75,000 may be the amount that you wanna put into the D4C, so that you know that Mary is gonna have extra money for the rest of her life. Because remember, in that situation, if Mary has very little in cash, then she may decide that she wants to take all of the money and put it into the D4C. Because remember, if Mary if puts all that cash aside, she can immediately qualify for MassHealth, right? Which means at the end, MassHealth will have a lien on her house, right? But she'll still have this pile of cash to use for the rest of her life, and that'll probably be enough money.
right? On the other hand, if Mary had a really big pile of money, if she had a couple of million dollars, right, versus the amount that she has here, she might want to not employ any of these strategies. She, she might actually want to pr uh, privately pay for the five years, knowing that at the end of that five year period, whatever money is left over is still going to be safe. Um, but the bottom line is that in all cases, at all cases, Mary can qualify for mass health. The only question is when you're trying to balance things out, does she want to qualify for mass health? Obviously, in Mary's case, the better alternative would be, would have been, prior to Frank's death, to have had all the assets shifted to Frank and have Frank put all of the money in trust for Mary's benefit after he died. So another alternative for Mary, um, in all cases, is she could get remarried. Right? But a lot of times that isn't really what people want to do. So if she's not going to get remarried, there are always alternatives. She can always qualify for mass health. The only question is, does she want to? Any questions on any of that? I know we covered a lot of material, and it is complicated. Yes, ma'am. I have a question about um, what that do with it. The que ah, okay. So the, like the question is, when I was given that example, I said as an alternative to doing the annuity, um, Mary could simply lend the money to her, one of her kids right. and have them pay her back with that same interest rate. And the answer is, it all goes to the nursing home. Remember, in, in the situation that I'm giving you, she, she, she has done this to qualify for Mass Health. So now her income, whether it's coming from the insurance company because it's an annuity every month, or it's coming from the promissory from her son because it's a promissory note and, the, and the, they, she gave the son the money, she's getting a check for three thousand a month. That is be, that is being added to the two thousand from Social Security and being sent to the nursing home. But what about wife to the husband? Oh, so you're using the first example. Yeah. What happens? It, oh, what happens if the asset gets shifted to the from the wife to the husband, and then the husband starts receiving these checks? Right. Because you're saying to yourself, you saw the slide that said the husband can't have more than $119,220 in assets. Isn't he going to go over? The answer is, to, for, for Mary to qualify, F Frank has to have less than $119,220 on the day that she qualifies. The day after, he can get a million dollars. He can hit the lottery. right? So the structuring always involves restructuring to make sure that Frank's assets remain below that magic number until Mary qualifies for mass health, Other, at, at which point he can get as much as he wants. And that's why in, in, a, in a case like the one that I had given you earlier, where really I was talking about a million, a million four hundred thousand dollar promissory note, this could, could generate some very big payments. You know? um, and, and so we're probably going to need to have Frank's resulting assets when we buy the promissory note be no more than maybe thirty or forty thousand dollars, so that even with these payments coming in every month, right, for several months, his number is going to stay below one hundred nineteen thousand two twenty, because we know that in the interim we can qualify Mary. You see how this works? Yeah. Okay. So that the, the goal of the exercise is Frank. Had, you know, if there's a sp if there are spouses and you transfer everything to the spouse at home and the spouse at home buys an annuity. That, that, that the assets of the spouse at home have to be below that magic number on the day that the person in the nursing home qualifies for mass health. After that, they can hit the lottery. Okay? So that was actually part of the conversation today, because on the one hand, the, the spouse at home really didn't want to lose control of all of that money for like a long period. He's fairly young, so he had about a 10-year life expectancy. But he said, I don't want to do a 10-year annuity. I want the money back. And I said, you can do that. You, don't ha you can buy it. You can do a five-year annuity. You, if you can find one, you can do a three-year annuity. Get all your money back more quickly. The only issue is, you know, you take a million four, right? And you, on a four-year annuity, or 40 is 48 payments, say, round to 50 payments, that, that annuity is going to be paying, like, a lot. <laughs> every, yeah, a lot every month, right? So on the D4C pool, mm -hmm. So the, the question is, what, what can be paid out of the D4C pool trust? And the answer is everything that you just said. Any, anything that is being spent on behalf of the person in the nursing home can be paid out of the D4C pool trust. F keeping the house up, even though she's not living there anymore, because she intends to return. Any legal fees, any accounting fees, anything, anything. The cost, we've had somewhere the D4C is actually paying for the cost of having somebody 
uh, just provide uh, um, just visiting somebody to visit because the, the relatives are all away or paying the gas and expenses for people who are away to kind of fly in and stay at a hotel and see Ma, right? Because oftentimes that's the situation, right? Kids are all over the place, you know? And, and anything which is for the benefit of the person in the nursing home is a legitimate D4C expense. And there's no special reason to be trying to keep that money intact, you know, because if you keep it, you're just going to be paying that extra commission at the end, right? So it's an ideal place to be allowing a senior to use their own money, right? Just going back to that case where Mary only had the $75,000. i have had cases, well, like the lady that I was telling you about, where there was no house. The lady just had $60,000 left. And this D4C provided this vehicle to, give, to, use the, to, to have something for the money, mother while she was alive, even if they had used all the money from the D4C. In that case, MassHealth simply would have no claim against anything because the lien is just against whatever is left over. Okay, any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah, just a quick question on the annuity. It would actually be a little better than that example. That is absolutely right. You know, so the, the, just for the, for the camera, the, the, the question was whether I wasn't underestimating the amount that was coming to Mary from that annuity because I was just dividing the amount she had by the number of months and not assuming any return on that investment. And the answer is that's right. That's absolutely right. So even if you get, but even, but I guess what I was suggesting is even if you have a zero return, the, uh, the result of doing the annuity or doing the D4C is that you are substantially um, lengthening the period of time, right, before which all the assets end up getting absorbed because you're reducing this burn rate. The key concept to understand is that, that, is that differential, the difference between the burn rate, the rate at which your savings are evaporating if you're on private pay versus if you're on mass health. And people will listen to this and say, well, but wait, who's getting hurt here? Well, who's getting hurt is honestly the nursing home. The nursing home, right? Because you're paying, you have a, the same person in the same bed getting the same service and you're paying them, in this case, $5,000 a month left, less, right? But the nursing homes get that. That's part of their business plan. I don't represent the nursing homes. Yes, ma'am, and then you start. Yes, ma'am. Can you go into a nursing home on private pay and then switch? Yes, that's as a matter of fact what most people do. Most people will go into a nursing home uh, on private pay and will pay one month. As a matter of fact, so nursing homes, while they're not supposed to discriminate, will always tell you that it always seems that there's a bed available if you're on private pay. Whereas if, there's, if you're on, going to be on mass health right away, they'll tell you there's a wait. So you often, you'll typically go in on private pay and then switch after that first month. You'll never get that first month back. Okay, yes, sir. And the uh, expenditures over the past five years? Mass health looks back five years, not regarding expenditures. Yes, regarding expenditures to see if there were any gifts. However, uh, the, there is no look back period regarding gifts between spouses. That's the reason why all this other stuff worked between Frank and Mary, because there is no look back period regarding those. Okay, so if you were, say, giving back. The question is, and this is legitimate, this question has come up a lot. Are you better off, therefore, if you're making gifts by giving them uh, cash instead of a check? The answer is kind of, except that when you, when you are, um, uh, that cash came from somewhere, right? So if the parent wrote the themselves a check for $5,000, right? MassHealth's going to ask about that. Right, because they're going to say, so what happened to that 5,000 exactly? Because the presumption is always that these funds resulted in gifts, and you and you are obligated to reverse the presumption, right? So the presumption is against you. It's, that's like, well, what if I tell them I went to Foxwoods, you know, and lost fifty thousand dollars? Okay, but show me some receipts that show me that you lost fifty thousand dollars while you were in Foxwoods. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. I'm sorry it was a little complicated, and we'll see you in a couple of months. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.